What would you do if you were trapped in your own life? Forced to live out a puppet show where no matter how far you run, how hard you try, you cannot escape. Would you still give it a go anyway, even if at every turn you're told to turn back? Well, in Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, this is a journey we see play out before our eyes. The biggest prison break since, well, prison break. Which starts out fun and jolly before turning hopeless and tragic. Providing some long awaited answers as to what's really going on here. So I thought it'd be a bunch of fun to join these murder puppets and take a peek behind the curtain of Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Episode 5. Now, I personally feel like the show is split into three separate parts. First, we have Jobs and Death, which introduced us to the rules of this world through more honest looks into the lies we're told as children. Then came Family and Friendship, which shook up the formula a little, with lessons taught by dishonest teachers with ulterior motives. And now, finally, we have Transport and Electricity, which focus on routines, never-ending cycles, and how in this world, you can never truly change no matter how hard you try. And in this third and final act, the teachers we've come to expect are still introduced, but quickly fade into the background, allowing us to see what happens when the trio are left to their own devices. So, will things get better or worse? Let's find out. Episode 5 opens up with the trio doing inventory. A very mundane task, and a seemingly pointless one, as the house never changes from episode to episode. As always, there's no background music. All we hear is the ticking of a clock, over and over, making this task feel like it's going even slower. Everything about this opening scene is intended to hammer home just how predictable the lives of the trio in the house are and provides a good look into the differing mindsets each of them has about episode 5's true lesson. Not transport, but change. Red tells the others that he hates the clipboard. Because I hate the clipboard. But it's not really the clipboard that he hates, it's what it represents. Their daily routine. Red sees it as a prison, a cycle that he can't get out of. And from what we've seen of him throughout the show, this comes as no surprise. Red stands out so much, not just because of his funky design, but because unlike everyone else, he's so indifferent to everything happening around him. He's not interested in any of it. I would really prefer to do as little as possible or nothing at all. Unless it involves the chance of giving him a different life. In the episode Death, he seemed glad when Duck died as now there'd be a new member of the crew. And he was a jolly fella on computer day because it was a little distraction from this life. A day which is different from their usual routine. But by far the happiest we've seen him is during the episode Family. And we can leave our pathetic life behind. Yay! Yay! Where he was more than glad to go with the creepy twins as they lured him along with the bait of a brand new family. I'm just happy to finally be with my family. You're ruining it. Red often lashes out at the other two members of the trio, and it's implied that most of the time he doesn't even like them. Oh come on, it's, it's not that bad. We didn't really like him anyway. I knew it. I'm not supposed to be living with these two things. But it's not necessarily them in particular that he hates. It's more likely he associates the house with them, even though they're just as much prisoners here as he is. But spend enough time with anyone and it's inevitable that at some point you're going to get on each other's nerves. I mean, that's why so many families fight. They even named a whole darn show after it. But Red doesn't care that they're also trapped here. He's finally reached his breaking point. I said, I hate the clipboard and I hate this place. <gasps> and this desire for a new life becomes overwhelming. No, I want to go somewhere different. I want to get out of this place. And can you really blame him? Each episode plays out like a fever dream. One that I think all of us would want to wake up from if we were forced to take part day in, day out. Now, of course, everyone is different, but when I do the same thing over and over every day, I find it hard to keep track of dates and memories. Everything sort of blends together. 
And this can be frustrating because you can become numb to it all. It can feel like you're constantly sleepwalking. Imagine for a moment you take the same walk every day. And the first time, it's just wonderful. Look at that tree. Look at that big old bush. Look at that birdie. And then the second time, it's still pretty wonderful. Oh cool, the tree. Oh cool, the big old bush. Oh cool, the birdie wordy. But then on your hundredth day of this walk, it becomes a drag. And you can almost switch your mind off because you've done it so many times. It's lost any significance. There's that tree again. There's that bush again. There's that bird again. Oh, he's dead. But you notice on the way, there's a path that you've never walked down before. What could be down it? Could be bad, could be amazing. Oh, what an adventure. I'm gonna walk down here instead. Break that routine, even if just a little. But there's a big difference between this scenario and Red's life in the house, because all of these exciting paths which run off the main track don't exist. He's made to walk the same route every day by unknown forces outside of his control. But Doug, on the other hand, doesn't appear to see things this way. He enjoys his life in the house with the trio, and the cycle that comes with it. It doesn't get much better than this. He keeps a tight grip on the clipboard, and refuses to let Yellow even hold it. He has to ensure that things play out as they always do. Every time he's gone against one of the teachers, it's been because he just wanted to go back home, and get on with what they're supposed to be doing. When are we going to go? I thought I was supposed to invent a digital currency. This isn't what we're supposed to be doing! And this could be because, to some people, a fixed routine provides comfort. It can help keep you on track, and stop you from spiralling. It all depends on the person. Neither's really better than the other. And Duck and Red are two ends of this scale. Mr. Go of the Flow, and Senor, we need a plan. It just so happens that in this occasion, we root for Red, because as a viewer, we know that this place isn't really their home. It's more of a cage, as we'll soon see how difficult it really is to escape. Red attempts to exit out the door into the living room, but as he steps in, Yellow and Duck are already there, waiting for him. He can't get away from them. And this is something which is expanded upon as the story progresses. The idea that simply changing your location isn't always going to change your routine. And this simple act is the first sign in this episode of the external force that's keeping them here. With Duck saying going anywhere else is not allowed, as though they need permission to leave from some kind of warden. All three of them must be here in order to act out this puppet show. Whoever is in control is clearly not happy with Red suggesting they do something against their grand design, something out of the routine. As just at this moment, the room begins shaking and an older trained gentleman pops in through their fireplace, sent as a distraction to keep Red from influencing any more change or free thinking. But Red is tired of these misguided teachings, he just wants some freedom. And what's this? Red's finally about to get his wish, because this train man reveals he's here to take them on a journey through the art of song, teaching them all about, well, transport. But it's quickly made apparent that he is still not in control. This is all just a trick, a mind game from the puppet master, to try and satisfy his longing to get out of the house, but under their terms. And Red sees right through it. Nice to be back at home, eh? Well, well no, I mean, what are you talking about? We didn't even go anywhere. Let's and he's right, it seems more like this is some kind of projection. Because of how old this train man is, midway through the song, he dies. Just when he's taken the form of a car, and when the 2D animation fades, the trio are still in the living room. They haven't moved at all. Red wants more than just transport. He wants a one-way ticket, rather than a round trip, which leads him straight back to the cause of his unhappiness. And now that this new life is on his mind, he'll stop at nothing to get it. But first, he needs to learn how to ghost ride the whip, finding a box full of tapes containing lessons on how to drive. But none of these lessons are correct, unless you're a character from Fast and Furious. It's all dangerous. Handbrake turns around tight corners at high speed are a great way to impress oh, new colleagues. No. This is the first of many obstacles which come in the way of Red's new life. 
and at every single one, Yellow and Duck accept defeat. They want to turn back and give up. We can't just do stuff, us three, can we? Remember, this isn't what they're supposed to be doing. Red gets frustrated and starts button mashing, eventually hitting Go. It's a success. They're traveling and Red is behind the wheel. But the trio have never experienced traveling away from home before. And Duck and Yellow are confused. The sky is rewinding. All of the sets in the show are still, and when jumping from location to location, we never see the journey, just them disappearing from one place and appearing in another. So now that the background is moving, it's so much more impactful, and almost feels like a different show. We even get what is arguably the only song in the series which stays fun throughout, and doesn't take a dark turn before it finishes. And we like having fun! Red doesn't even care that they're essentially just doing what they always do, sitting around as a trio talking. As now, there's potential. He's behind the wheel, in control of his own life. Control being the important word here. As when Duck asks if he can drive for a bit, Red shuts him down. No, 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 you, you stay back there in your area. Distracting him with a TV instead. I find it interesting how, now that the power dynamic of who's in charge has shifted from the Puppet Master to Red, that he's beginning to use the same tricks that were being used on him, distracting the others to stop them from asking questions, which keeps them in the dark and him in control. And by placing both Yellow and Duck in the back seat, it establishes Red as the new guy in charge. But this battle for control between Red and the Puppet Master isn't over just yet. They have one last obstacle up their sleeve. The car's talking GPS pops up to give them directions, except it keeps trying to guide them back home. Let's get you home, shall we? Okay, back home it is. You can go home. Which Red becomes frustrated with, checking the GPS out the window. And its final words are, Hold on, you're making a mistake. What about you? It sounds desperate, and it makes you start to wonder that maybe whatever's keeping them in the house isn't doing so out of cruelty. Maybe it's trying to shield the trio from what's really out there. But Red is determined to find out for himself. We now see that Red has a specific location in mind, a community that he's read about in a flyer. Handing it to Yellow to read, we then enter his mind as he dreams of this wonderful place. It has the aesthetic of an old English village, what kind of idiot would want to live in one of them? The dream takes on a sort of visual travel guide, with narration from a friendly woman telling visitors all about the joys of living in one of these communities. Opening shop. <laughs> what a lot of hoovers. But what's Molestown all about? Well, the village is populated by characters which resemble the puppets from famous British animation Postman Pat, a true childhood classic. They look a bit more friendly than most of the other puppets we see throughout the show. It all seems so much more calm and peaceful here, bright and sunny. And if you've ever been to the UK, you know that the sun isn't real. Just a bit of banter. It all points towards this place, which you'd be crazy to not want to live in. This promotional video offers up a happy, unrealistic scenario, rather than the darker truth as we'll later learn that everything we're told about the place the trio are headed is a lie. But where this dream really gets interesting is when Yellow interacts with this narrator as she shows him around, taking him to his new home. The neighbours look worried, as though they know something bad is about to happen. But despite this, they welcome Yellow with a gift, a bird, often seen as a sign of freedom as being able to fly allows you the luxury to go wherever you please in an instant. And just like the trio in the house, this bird is trapped inside a colourful cage. And the narrator is opposed to this idea of freedom, describing the bird as Oh, it's a rat, or some kind of worthless animal. Her relaxing voice and inviting tone are slipping. The bird, now free, flies away, yellow chasing after it running into the road and getting flattened. Now, this scene seems pretty normal at first. Well, normal for don't hug me, I'm scared. But take a closer look and it seems to hold many clues towards what's really going on here. Now, this voice isn't just the voice narrating the dream, 
but the one in control of this place. This isn't the last time we'll hear it. Another important detail is that when Yellow is hit by the car, the narrator's scream is one of so much pain. Not the kind that a random narrator or teacher would have for one of the trio, as no one here seems to really care about them. This isn't just any old story that's being told, it's a memory. I believe we're seeing the truth behind what happened to someone very close to this mystery woman. Whoever created this place had a son who was killed the same way, chasing a bird into the road, which would explain why she has so much disgust for this worthless animal. Or some kind of worthless animal. She blames it for what happened to her boy. And let's not forget, in the episode Death, the coffin originally guessed that Yellow was the dead one, not Doug, and on the tombstone was written the name David, which is likely what the big D on Yellow's overalls stands for, the son's name. The Yellow we know is a recreation of this son, a puppet forced to live out this existence so the creator can pretend he's still around, which is why she does everything in her power to make sure they stay in line. And by keeping the trio in this never-ending routine and distracting them every time they become aware and defiant, she likely believes that she's shielding them from the harsh truth of their reality. That they have no free will, because, well, they're puppets. I mean, the whole show is about shielding the trio from the cruelties of reality by telling them a happier lie instead. Now, this theory runs deeper, so I'll talk more about it at the end of the video and in the next video when we have more information. So, subscribe and hit the bell if you don't want to miss it. When Yellow wakes from this nightmare, things are very different. The bird which Yellow was gifted now lays dead on the window, the symbol of freedom gone. It's no longer a fun road trip for the trio. As they travel further and further from the house, everything that we've come to expect from the show fades away. The mood about this journey has completely changed. I want to go home. Uh, no. The vibrant blue sky has darkened, and many of the trees are now dead. Duck's TV turns off, and the curtain is pulled back. A nice little nod to how the curtain covering their reality is about to disappear. It turns out Mr. Transport isn't really dead, and now that he's awake, he doesn't want them behind the wheel. After all, he was sent here to keep them in line. And it's kind of unsettling because they're inside a sentient being as they're caught red-handed, and you're not quite sure how he's going to react. And because red does usually sound so monotone, and we can leave our pathetic life behind, it's so much more impactful to hear him so emotional. Can't go back, I'm not going back into that house! This is by far the most exaggerated we've seen him apart from his throwaway line in the opening to the episode Friendship. We live in an actual nightmare! His emotions throughout the show range from dissatisfied, to annoyed, to desperate, but it never really swings back the other way. He never really has a moment of happiness, and on the very rare occasion he does, it never lasts, or it's not even real. Red is so determined to escape, he finishes Mr. Transport off, suffocating him with Siggy's. However, this doesn't solve his problem, because as the car dies, it begins to stop, and that control, that ability to travel wherever he wishes, stops with it. Their surroundings begin to glitch out, like a simulation breaking, and this is when we get the big reveal. They haven't arrived at this wonderful, friendly community that was promised, instead, they're in the most terrifying place there is. Reality and a grim one too. They're in a junkyard, and this is an excellent choice of location, as it couldn't be more different from their lives in the children's puppet show. In their house, everything is so smooth, so soft. The lighting is even and controlled, making it look like a live action cartoon. But now, everything's a mess. There's no order or structure. It's all decaying, falling apart. Just look at them against this background. They don't belong here and it's likely the Puppet Master knew this. It makes you wonder whether they would have been better off if they'd have just stayed in the house, kept the mystery of what's out there as just a nice dream, something to keep Red going, because now he knows there's no better life out there waiting for him. It's either a colourful, overwhelming prison, 
or a grey cold wasteland. And I guess technically he got what he wanted to see something else, but it's not how he imagined it. It's not better than his current situation. And it gets worse. Night comes, and as they sit around in the cold, burning what's left of Mr. Transport for warmth, Duck picks up a clipboard and begins to do inventory. One rock, one stick. The same thing that started the episode off. The same thing which Red wanted to escape from. The routine. No matter how far he runs or where he goes, as long as he's in the trio, he can't escape it. He's in denial now. Yeah, they'll be here. Don't worry. Somebody will, somebody will turn up. He can't accept reality. Or at least, not this reality. Red is driven by the idea that, well, maybe I'd be thriving if I was somewhere else. When really, changing your environment won't necessarily change your situation. Because it can be driven by things outside your control. Red, like most of us, can be pessimistic. So I think no matter where he and the trio ended up, he'd still be unsatisfied. Because there isn't this perfect place out there where all your problems disappear. If you watched my first video, you might remember I called Red the straight man of the group. And no, that isn't a comment about his sexuality. Puppet Master. When can I leave to be on my own? I've got the whole world to see. But more, how human he acts when compared to everyone else in the show. His lack of enthusiasm. His reserved voice. I'd say that Red is the most relatable out of the trio. I originally thought of him as the main character, even though Yellow clearly has more relevance to the overall story and bigger picture. But Red's outlook and mindset is one which I believe a lot more people have than you might think. And in this case, Red's inability to find happiness is literal. There's an actual being stopping it from happening. But in reality, there isn't necessarily this one being. But there are still countless other complicated factors outside our control which can make us feel unsatisfied. There's mental health issues that can make going out of your comfort zone extremely draining or feel as though change is hopeless. Not to mention the fact that it's easier than ever now to compare yourself to others. There are countless reasons why people might feel dissatisfied. And this desire to escape might not necessarily be about getting out of a physical exact location, but really about wanting to get out of your head, away from those negative thoughts. And throughout this video, I've been talking about this routine as if it's a bad thing. And that's only because this is how Red sees his. Partly because he's not in control of it. But I think it's important to find out where you fit on this scale. Because again, it's all preference. This episode is just more about the tragedy of a character who craves excitement and something new, but is forced into a routine that isn't even their own. But this isn't the end of Red's story. It's time for reveal number two, because we then see the hand of not a puppet, but a real woman, the first human we've seen in the show. And it's likely that as a human, she's the one in control, as every puppet has a person pulling the strings. This woman places a miniature of the car they traveled in outside a model of their house. The same model we've seen during every single intro to every single episode. But this time, there's more context. This is where the trio's whole lives play out. And there is someone much, much larger in control of their every move, able to shift them back and reset them anytime they wish, like their playthings. And this woman gives us what sounds like a nursery rhyme. But no matter how much the wheels turn, huh? the journey always ends up back at home which when taken alone and out of context is a very comforting line. It's reassurance, but it holds a darker meaning when your home is your prison. It's almost another way of saying, no matter how hard you try, you're never going to leave. They can get in a car, travel to the edge of the world until it crumbles around them, but they still can't escape the cycle. No matter what they do, the puppet master will put it all back in place to make it perfect or at least what her view of perfect is anyway. Red doesn't even have the freedom to go live in a barren wasteland. Despite looking and acting the most human, Red truly is a puppet. 
And you could argue that, well, at least Red isn't out in the wasteland, so maybe he should be grateful he's kept in the dark, because what he already has is certainly better. But I personally feel that with the logic of, you should be happy because things could be worse, then that in turn means you should be sad because things could be better. It's kind of a glass half full or glass half empty argument, and things are never that simple. It's never black and white, and Red's life in the house isn't a good thing by any means, just because it's a better alternative. But if the trio really do have no free will and this woman is in control, why were the events of this episode even allowed to play out? Why let them escape and venture out into the real world if they're just going to be reset at the end anyway? Well, this puppet master appears to be losing control of her creations, because the trio are a defiant little bunch, and the lessons never stick. In the end, they disagree with them, and come to their own conclusion about the topic being discussed. So now, us and the trio are aware that there's nothing out there. Nothing good anyway. But, unlike us, they're still in the dark about the fact that there even is a puppet master. They didn't see a woman place the car back at the house. They'll probably just wake up the next morning as they always do, unaware of how they got home, or even that they went on a journey at all. Of course, Red knows something is off, but he doesn't know why. We're still one step ahead of them when it comes to the bigger picture. And episode six shows us what happens when one of the trio does become aware of this knowledge, that their movements are being controlled by a higher power. And boy, is it incredible. Now, I mentioned before how this is the episode that made me even want to start doing videos on Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. If you look at my channel before these, all my videos were around 10 minutes long. And I'd spend about a week on each one. And I'd been thinking that I'd really like to go into detail on one show. You know, just like sink myself into it, get all up in it with my grubby little fingies. But that's a big commitment. You know, we're talking a couple months of work. And so I kept putting it off. And then one day, you know, I stuck this show on and I got to this episode and I was just like, okay, this is it. This is the show. If I'm going to spend a lot of time on any show, then this deserves it more than any. You know, despite having a new theme every single week, at its core, Don't Hug Me I'm Scared is a show about being trapped. Trapped in your job. Trapped by your grief. Trapped in your family. Trapped in a toxic friendship. And in this episode, trapped in your life. And I think it's no accident that this episode comes at this point in the series, after tackling these topics, as these four things are what tend to have the biggest impact on us. And I think that's why this is probably my personal favourite. Even though I can acknowledge the finale is probably better made. Being more exciting throughout with its mind-bending concepts, this one just feels like a culmination of everything I love about the show. Yes, it takes a while to get to that tragic ending, but when it does, it's just so impactful. And I think if this last shot of the Puppet Master wasn't included, and this was the final episode, I would be pretty happy with this ending. I'm glad that didn't happen because episode six truly is incredible. And if you asked me on another day, I'd probably flip flop between which one I love more. But I really do think that anyone can relate to transport on at least some level. So next up is the final episode, the grand finale. I gotta be honest, I have no idea when it's gonna come out. I wanted to take a bit of time, you know, make this one the best it can possibly be, you know. And also it's gonna be the longest one as well. But in the meantime, I've got a load of videos I'm really excited about coming soon. I've got a ranking of every single Love Death Robot. I've got a ranking of every Doctor Who villain from goofy to terrifying. So grab a brewski, hit that subscribe button, and I will see you very soon. Oh, also, if you liked any of the drawings in this episode, or any of this, or this, or this, or this, then check out my Instagram. It's waterwavy4ys, four whole whys. Thank you, I love you, goodbye.